Hello, everybody. This is Juan Carlos Brando. Thank you for joining us today in this show with the attorney Francis Fongsheng, who is uh, part of the immigration law firm of Margaret W. Wong that has been working on this field for over 45 years. She's traveling right now. She's in the city of Atlanta, and the attorney Francis is in the city of Cleveland. Uh, so please feel free to ask your questions regarding to the immigration field. And the attorney Francis Funson, with his experience, he will answer all of your questions and clarify all of your needs regarding to immigration and to this uh, interesting field in the United States. Uh, attorney Francis, thank you for having us. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing very good. Thank you so much. It's getting kind of warm here in Atlanta. So... Uh, I don't know how cold it's there in Cleveland, but it's, I bet it's way colder than here in the city of Atlanta. So, Attorney Francis, um, since we are starting the, uh, well, we are in the middle of the month of February, I would like to start by talking about the filings for H-1B visas. We know there are some deadlines that are important for this time of the year, and How could an employer prepare in order to file for an employee? Okay. So if an employer wants to hire an employee, whether that person is in the United States or overseas, uh, that person needs a work visa to work in the United States. One of the most common types of work visas is the H-1B. And the H-1B is for what are called specialty occupations. And that means a job that requires at least a bachelor's degree in a specific field. So that means if you want to be an accountant, usually you have to have at least a bachelor's degree in accounting. Or if you're going to be a mechanical engineer, you would need a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Okay. So first you would need a job offer, an employer willing to file the H-1B. All right. And then to actually go through the application process, if you've never had the H-1B before, Since there are a limited number of new H-1Bs that can be approved each year, you have to go through a lottery process because there are always more applicants than the number of H-1Bs allowed. And so when is this lottery held? It will be held between March 1st to March 18th. That's when you register for the lottery. So contact your employer, contact an immigration lawyer to start this registration process very quickly because it has to be submitted March 1st to March 18th. After you register for the lottery, the lottery will be held and you'll be notified March 31st or April 1st, whether you've been selected. If you are selected, then the lawyer can file the H-1B petition to the immigration service to request legal status, okay? So the important thing is make sure that you register for the lottery March 1st to March 18th of 2022. Thank you so much, Attorney Francis. And we have a bunch of questions that a lot of people are starting to ask today. Uh, we say hi to um, some people. I don't, I, I cannot pronounce the name, but thank you so much for asking your questions today. Um, this uh, next question I design and build kitchens, but I didn't study for that. I've been doing this for 15 years already. Can I file? I am from Colombia and I need, I live in Colombia, but a friend of mine wants to file for me. I assume the, this friend is a business owner here doing something related to building kitchens or something like that. Okay, so when we're talking about filing, The question is, are we going to try to file for a temporary work visa or are we trying to file for the green card or U.S. permanent residency? Okay. Temporary visas, designing and building kitchens, it's very difficult to get a temporary work visa for that because H-1Bs, like I just talked about, require at least a bachelor's degree in a specific field, has to be a specialized job. There are no special visas from Colombia. And so probably the only other temporary work visa would be an O-1, which is for extraordinary ability. Have you won any awards for building kitchens? Have you been in the newspaper or 
from magazines because your work is well known? Have you received any recognition for your work? Okay, then you might be able to qualify for an O-1, a temporary work visa. Now, if we're talking about the green card, green card sponsorship, a U.S. employer can sponsor a potential worker in any job. It doesn't matter if you don't have a degree, if you only have work experience, that is fine. Someone who designs and builds kitchens, it actually might be more important for you to have that experience than to have a degree. And so that process is called labor certification or PERM, P-E-R-M. An employer can sponsor an employee. There are three steps. The first step is this labor certification where we advertise the job in the local newspaper and other types of ads to see if there are qualified U.S. workers who would be harmed if you got this job. If nobody qualified responds to the advertisements, then you can file this labor certification. The second step is called the I-140. That's the employer petition. That's where we show that the employer makes enough money, has enough good enough tax return to pay you the salary and that you actually have the experience that's required for this job. Do you have the past experience letter? Do you have the necessary skills? And the last step is applying for the green card or the immigrant visa. If you're in Colombia, then we will schedule an interview at the U.S. Embassy in Colombia for you to get your immigrant visa, which if it's approved, you use that to fly to the United States and then the green card is just mailed to the U.S. address. All right. So you should be fine even without a degree. Perfect. Thank you so much, Attorney Francis. And this is a very clear answer about how uh, you could do in this case, maybe your case is not for an H-1B visa specifically, but you have other options that you could file better. So please give us a call. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. And we have another person that is saying, uh, this is actually in our inbox, and I will re read it. Last time you said on the video that if you have a sponsor on, in the United States who is offering a job, uh, can apply for the lottery for the immigrant. I would like to know what form is it. Could you tell me for a uh, form number uh, that costs ten dollars to fill up? Uh, I sponsoring company needs to fill that form before. March 1st, please help me if possible or just let me know the form that needs to be filled up. Okay, so you're talking about the H-1B lottery, okay? Now, to register for the lottery, it's all done online through the U.S. CIS website. The, the employer or the lawyer has to create an online account called a My U.S. CIS account on the U.S. CIS website, and then you would log in. The employer would log into that account to register for the lottery and to pay the ten dollars and include your information you do not register for the lottery it's the employer that registers you do not submit a form it's all done online okay and this is not done before march 1st this is done between march 1st and march 18th so don't you can't do it early you can't do it late do it between march 1st and march 18th If you are selected in the lottery, the employer will get notified by an email. And then you have 60 days to file the form I-129 and the H-1B petition paperwork. That is the actual H-1B application that goes by mail to the immigration service. Okay, So that's only if you are selected in the lottery. Then you use form I-129. That's interesting. And this uh, about the lottery and how it works. So how many uh, applications do we get per year for this uh, H-1B visas? So there are 85,000 slots each year for new H-1Bs. It sounds like a lot, but each year they're usually more than 100,000 registrations. And now because it's all done online and you don't have to do a lot of work preparing the entire package, There are even more applicants probably. The Immigration Service doesn't publish how many registrations there are because this electronic registration only started maybe two, three years ago. 
but it's it's getting more and more difficult to get selected. So there are definitely more applicants now. That that's impressive, and well, a lot of people want to come and work here, uh, and maybe they could, but they need to do it on time. They need to do it with the right attorney, and you need to call the office of the attorney Margaret W. Wong, who has been working on this field for over forty-five years. And one of the experts in this area is the attorney Francis Fomsen, who has been working in this field for several years. How many years have you been working on this uh, work-based uh, visa applications? It's more than 14 years now. More than 14 years now. Yeah. And it's awesome how uh, each part of the application, first you need to go here, then you need to go there, then you need to uh, wait for the answer of this department or this organization, and then you do the filing. It's a lot of work and it needs to be done by a person that is an expert. So please, if you want to do this and you want to do it effectively, please give us a call. Uh, maybe you will talk to the attorney Francis Fung Sang or to the attorney Margaret W. Wong and they will start filing for you. But you need to do it now because the filing deadline is March uh, the 1st until March the 18th. So we need to start working on it right now and we would have 20 days until uh, the date for the deadline. Um, this next person um brought the question this way i will read the english part i don't know if it's the translation um or maybe if you can read it um but well hi lawyer if you read my message could you please reply i want to go to the united states for right of political asylum i checked the relevant introduction and background of your law firm on google i think you are very professional if you can speak chinese That's best fitting for me. Uh, I think this message is directly for Ms. Wong. But a person from, I assume, is uh, Hong Kong, maybe, or China, uh, could file for asylum here in the United States? Okay. If the person is physically overseas, in the home country, in China or wherever, then that person cannot apply for asylum. Because asylum is only something you apply for if you are physically present in the United States. So if this person wants to apply for asylum, political asylum, he or she has to actually get to the United States and apply here, okay? If you are overseas, the process is called a refugee process, and that's very different. Asylum in the United States, you apply with the U.S. Immigration Service or you apply with an immigration judge. Overseas, to become a refugee, you have to either be referred by... Uh, the U.S. government, or you apply with the United Nations Refugee Commission, okay? And uh, so that's something that you would have to, if you're overseas, you would have to contact the United Nations. If you're in the United States, you apply for asylum. Okay, yeah, th this is uh, something that people need to know. A lot of people get confused that they could file for asylum overseas, and Uh, one of the, the things that you need to know is that you should be physically in the United States. It's not a guarantee that you will be approved, but at least uh, some people try and, or a lot of people try and they get a result. It takes a long time because uh, it's taking very long right now, but at least you can be in the United States Uh, meanwhile, you are waiting for your result. Uh, this next person is uh, from India. I am a lawyer from India. I came here on 2015 with B1, B2. I don't have any status. So can I do some file for make good status? Okay. So if you entered legally, but you don't have any legal status now, that means you overstayed, then that limits your options significantly. Because we talked about before, there's two sides to immigration. There's the temporary visa side, and then there's the green card permanent residency side. Okay? If you are looking at the temporary visa side, almost always you would have to file 
a change of status from one legal status to another. So if you overstay, you don't have any legal status now, it makes it very difficult to get a change of status approved. Okay, so that means if you hear you overstayed on your B1, B2 visitor, you want to apply to become a student, an international student, you've already overstayed six to seven years, you would, the immigration service will not approve that change of status because of that large gap. Now, there are some statuses where even if you overstayed, you're still eligible for the status. That includes the U visa, which if you are a victim of certain crimes and you agreed to help the police or you did help police and you were injured as a result of that crime, either physically or emotionally or psychologically, then you can try to apply for a U visa. And it doesn't matter if you don't have legal status, if you entered illegally, that law is to protect victims of crime, okay? Otherwise, you have to look at the permanent residency side, okay? Some applications, you do have to show legal status. So if you have an employer willing to file for you, unfortunately, you have to show legal status throughout this whole process. There is an exception called 245I. If somebody filed for you or for your parents, before April 30th of 2001, then the old law protects you even if you overstayed. But if you do not have that protection, then you would have to show legal status to go through an employment-based immigration. Another option is family-based immigration. If you are married to a US citizen, as long as you enter legally, you are eligible to apply for the green card, even if you overstayed many years. Same if, if you have a U.S. citizen adult child who's over the age of 21, that adult child can petition for you for the green card, even if you overstayed all those years. However, if you have a brother or sister, or if you have a parent filing for you, and you're now over the age of 21, you do have to show legal status to get the green card or apply for a waiver called an I-601A, to forgive any illegal status you've had, okay? And the last option is if you want to seek asylum because you have been threatened or harmed or you're afraid of threats or harm, if you go back to your country, then that's something that you can try to pursue. Now, it's gonna be more difficult for you because you've overstayed a few years. The usual rule is you have to apply for asylum within one year of coming to the United States. And so you would have to justify why you waited so long to apply. Perfect. Thank you so much, Attorney Francis. And don't forget that if you need more information, you can call. The phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. It's the Attorney Francis Fungsing. He is uh, answering all of our questions right now live in this uh, Q&A session. So, um, Attorney Francis, I have a question which is in Spanish. Uh, what I will do is I will translate after you answer the question, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, well, uh, but the last part of the question of the prior, uh, the previous person is, if I can make a status, how long do I have to wait uh, until I can do it? Well, I mean, it's not a period, a question of waiting, because if you're overstayed, you're still going to be out of status, even if you keep waiting. So maybe you have to wait until the law changes or unless there's some benefit that you do qualify for, or that comes up, like maybe later if you do get married, or if your child does turn 21, then maybe you would qualify later on. Okay, perfect. I hope that the baby that we are seeing in the pictures is your baby, and maybe they can grow, and hopefully if they are born in the United States, you could have a chance of filing in the future. Um, this question is, uh, uh, to my personal Facebook, I have seen that you are working with an immigration law firm. My husband is from Haiti, and we are married, uh, but we live in Chile for two years. We have wanted to ask for refugee in the border uh, between Mexico and the United States. We don't have a permanent residency in Chile. Uh, do we need a birth uh, a marriage certificate from venezuela or the one that we have in chile will help us 
we are still waiting for an answer to our case, but our situation is not definitive in Chile. Okay. So if you are legally married, it doesn't matter where you are legally married, as long as the marriage was registered with the local government. That means if you got married in Chile, you do not have to get remarried in Venezuela. Each country, including the United States, will recognize that marriage as a legal marriage. Okay, that's number one. Number two, uh, the uh, refugee process. Uh, or maybe the right, asylum process. The asylum process. But it seems like this person is actually overseas, not physically in the United States. Right? No, this person is in Chile. Okay. So then if this person is waiting for the refugee process, then you have to wait for the United Nations or the U.S. Refugee Agency to process the application. It is not the asylum process, which happens in the United States or at the U.S. border. Okay. Yes, I think that's part of their question. They they are maybe thinking about coming to the south border and uh, surrender. They're... Uh, stating that maybe they are scared in Chile or that they are still waiting for uh, their status. But uh, the best thing they can do is get a good assessment with good attorneys. The uh, law firm of the attorney Margaret W. Wong and the attorney Francis Fungsang, they can help you. We have several attorneys that can uh, help your case. So let me translate really quick and I'll get back to English. Eh, nos dice el abogado Francis con respecto a su pregunta de eh, que su esposo es haitiano y usted es venezolano pero están en Chile no importa si ustedes se casaron en Chile o si se casaron en Venezuela eh, porque es uno de los alegatos que ustedes van a poder establecer eh, solo para demostrar que están casados eh, ahora si la situación es para solicitar estatus de refugio ustedes tendrían que comunicarse con la oficina de las Naciones Unidas en el país donde ustedes se encuentran o si lo van a hacer en la frontera sur de México tienen que tener los motivos suficientes para demostrar que tienen miedo de regresar a su país pero el lugar donde se casaron no es lo más importante in this case. Thank you so much, Attorney Francis. Uh, the next question is um, when, oh, my wife told me that she's being abused at work. Can you represent my wife? Okay, so first of all, we handle immigration primarily. So if this is an immigration problem or she has an immigration status problem, then maybe we can help. Otherwise, if this is an employment discrimination problem, then you would want to talk to a discrimination or employment attorney. That's number one. Number two, if she doesn't have any immigration status or she has an immigration issue and she's being abused at work, then we have to get some more details about what this abuse is. I mean, it's possible that she could qualify for a U visa if the, there's a qualifying crime involved. And so if it is a crime and it's on the list and she reports this crime to the police and she's willing to assist the police in their investigation, then it's possible that this could be a U visa qualifying situation. Okay. Or if she has, for example, an H-1B, on an H-1B, you're only allowed to work for that employer. But what if the employer is abusing the process, not treating her well? Is there something that she can do? Well, we would need some more information about that employment and what's happening there to see if we can protect her status. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Francis. And the next question is, uh, when I filed a petition for my relative, I was a lawful permanent resident, green card holder. I recently became a U.S. citizen. How does it affect my family members? Okay, so this depends on which category and who, which family members you are filing for, okay? Because a U.S. citizen or green card holder can file for spouse, can file for a child, can file for an adult son or daughter, okay? So if this is filing for a spouse or for a child, a minor child, then you can send a copy of your citizenship certificate to the National Visa Center, which is part of the State Department and notify them that now you are naturalized. And so maybe they can speed up your case, okay? If 
uh, you are filing for an adult son or daughter and you will become a U.S. citizen. Actually, the process is slower for adult sons or daughters of U.S. citizens than it is for adult sons or daughters of permanent residents. So you can actually uh, opt out. That means decide not to claim to be a U.S. citizen and keep the case in the adult son or daughter of a permanent resident category. That's the F2B category, rather than automatically transitioning to the F1 son or daughter of U.S. citizen category. Okay, so this is kind of a strategic uh, situation because it could be uh, slow the process down by more than a year if you upgrade the case to F1 son or daughter of U.S. citizen. So I would recommend you contact an immigration attorney to discuss how to make this transition. Thank you so much, Attorney Francis. And don't forget that the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984, offices in the United States, the city of Atlanta, Chicago, Columbus, Cleveland, Memphis, Minneapolis, Nashville, New York, and Raleigh, North Carolina. And the phone number is just one, 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Um, I was granted I-42B on October 1st, 2020. How much more I have to wait for the judge writing approval? How do I know someone from uh, Margaret Wong is uh, paying attention to my case. Okay. So if the judge tells you at your court hearing day, your case looks good, I'm going to approve your case. That does not mean the case is officially approved. That's because there are only a limited number of 42B. That means cancellation of removal or 10 year cancellation approvals that can happen each year in the United States. So if judges approve the cancellation cases up to that limit, then the immigration service will stop processing those approvals until the following year where more numbers will come up, okay? The immigration fiscal year goes from October 1st until September 30th. And so that means new numbers come up October 1st, okay? So it, how long you wait depends on how many judges are approving these 42B cases nationwide. Now, when will you find out? If the judge approves the case, official approval, then they will mail a decision to your home address and to the lawyer's address, okay? It'll be the approval. And once you have that approval, then you can make an appointment at the local immigration office to process the actual green card to be mailed to you, okay? So watch out for that approval paper, either at your mail or with the lawyer's office mail, and then we'll go through the next steps to make sure you get the green card, okay? And so it's not that we're not, the lawyer isn't doing anything or that the judge is being very slow, it's because there are a limited number that can be approved each year and the judge has to mail that approval before we can take the next step. Yeah, and this uh, for this case, the answer as well, uh, for Ibet is if you want to call today to the office and maybe you can just tell your name or they will check by your phone number and they will find out who is the attorney assigned to your case and you can ask for a status of your application or your file. Uh, so just please give us a call today, uh, 216-279-3984 and we will be happy to give you the answers you need uh, for your immigration case. Um, this question is, the uh, I think, the last one we're going to answer today because we have only one more minute and we don't want to steal your time, Attorney Francis. Uh, good afternoon. I have a question. What possibilities do I have to do something? I have five children born in the United States. The oldest one is, turn, is turning 21 in May, and I have been here for 23 years in this country. Okay. So you probably know that if you have a U.S. citizen child and that child turns 21, that child can petition you for the green card. However, whether you qualify for the green card depends on how you enter the United States and whether you have 
any other relatives in the United States. That's because if you enter the United States legally on a visa, then a U.S. citizen child over the age of 21 can petition for you for the green card and you can get the green card within a year. However, if you entered illegally, that means without inspection, then you don't qualify automatically to get the green card, even if you are petitioned by your U.S. citizen son or daughter over the age of 21, you might have to process your case through the U.S. embassy in your home country and be interviewed there. But if you've been illegally here for more than one year and you leave the United States to go to your interview, you will have what's called a 10 year bar. You can't come back for 10 years unless you get a waiver to forgive that 10 year bar. And the only way to get a waiver to forgive that bar is if you have a parent or a spouse who's a US citizen or a green card holder, and that person would have extreme hardship if you could not come back to the United States, okay? So you would apply for this waiver called an I-601A before you leave the United States to go to the interview. So that's one option. Another option is if you are in removal or deportation proceedings and you've been, it says you've been in the United States for more than 10 years, you have five children, you might qualify for what's called cancellation of removal or 10 year cancellation, that's where your relatives, your children would experience exceptional hardship. Life would be very tough for them if you could not stay in the United States. And you show the 10 years of physical presence. You show that you have those relatives. You show that you're a person of good moral character. And you show all that hardship that the kids would have if you could not stay here. Okay. And then the immigration judge can approve your green card. Thank you so much, Attorney Francis. Maybe I need to translate this answer. Uh, but um, one of the questions that the Attorney Francis, uh, I need to talk in Spanish, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, la, la, la respuesta del abogado Francis nos dice que eh, posiblemente usted haya, eh, tenga algunas posibilidades eh, si usted, eh, al saber que sus hijos son mayores de 21 años, ya usted podría aplicar o ellos podrían aplicar por usted. Sin embargo, la forma de saber esto es si usted entró legal o ilegalmente, si tiene una entrada legal a los Estados Unidos, para saber si pueden aplicar directamente o necesita otro familiar, otro relativo, otro hermano, una, eh, un papá, mamá, esposo, que sea ciudadano americano, que pueda aplicar por usted para que usted pueda eh, arreglar su estatus dentro de los Estados Unidos. Si no, Vemos que usted tiene cinco hijos nacidos aquí en el país. Entonces la forma también podría ser que si usted está en un proceso de deportación, se puede aplicar la forma I-42B en la cual eh, podemos alegarla porque usted tiene más de 10 años en los Estados Unidos. Y eh, bueno, una de las razones sería que la vida para sus hijos sería demasiado difícil si tuvieran que irse de regreso a su país de origen. Así que usted podría aplicar en los dos casos. Si tiene otro familiar calificado, podría aplicar por el perdón 601A o en el segundo de los casos podría aplicar por la forma I-42B, pero ahí tendría que estar usted en un proceso de inmigración, de eh, deportación frente a un juez. Así que si tiene más preguntas, por favor, puede llamar directamente a las oficinas de la abogada Margaret Wong al 216-279-3984. Back to English. Thank you so much, Attorney Francis, and I'll see you soon, right. hopefully. Sure, thank you for having me. And thank you for okay. all the information and for sharing all your knowledge uh, every time that we have the chance to talk to you. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. And for everybody who is joining us or who joined us for today's show, please don't forget to call 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984, offices in nine cities of the United States, Atlanta, Chicago, Columbus, Cleveland, Memphis, Minneapolis, Nashville, New York, and Raleigh, North Carolina. And the phone number is 216-279-3984. See you next time and take care. Thank you.